my name's Bob Frank. Uh, I've been with the IONS Group. Uh, well, you've probably seen me at some of the earlier sessions uh, for several years. And um, I'm going to moderate uh, today's panel. We've got three experiencers this morning. And when we, we put together the program, we tried to, to set the panels up so that there was some commonality or sort of a thread of, of continuity between the speakers. And, and when the submissions came in from the, from the speakers, we, we saw some certain things in, in our three speakers in, on today's panel. Uh, and so we said, let's, let's focus on this one area. And if you, you've, you've heard a lot of the experiences, you've read a lot of the material around experiences, there's this thing called the data download, the information dump, drinking from the fire hose, information, things. When they go into the experience, and many, many, many experiencers get this massive amount of information, messages, things that they get during their experience. And so we saw a very common thread between our three speakers of, of messages that they got, things that they were given, gifts that they were given, so what we've asked them to do is, is talk this morning about 15 minutes each, and then we'll try to leave 10 minutes or so afterwards uh, that you can come up and ask questions, and we'll, we'll have them and try to answer the, your, your questions. Uh, but we're going to ask them to, to take about 15 minutes each, talk a little bit about their experience, just to set the context. Because every experience is a, is, a, is a little bit different. So just to set the context, but then focus on what it was that they got. What did they receive? What was the, the, the data? What was the information? What was the gift? What was conveyed to them? Or the answers that, that, that came to their questions as during, that, during that experience or afterwards, because as you probably know, many of these things come afterwards. They come later. It's what's after the experience in, in, the, in, the, in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. So um, we're going to, uh, Lisa Evers is going to go first. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, let them talk a little bit about their experience, and then they can, then they can f convey their message. So it'll be Lisa Evers, uh, Jim Bays, and then we're, uh, J.C. Gordon. So Lisa, please. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to have to stand up here. <laughs> um, my name is Lisa D. Evers, uh, and I'm grateful that Eben Alexander was the opening act for us. You know, I <laughs> I really appreciate that, and I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm very honored. One of the things that he touched on was the religious aspect, um, and that was something that I had taken with me on my death experience. I was brought up in a Methodist church um, when I was young, and then we were privileged and went to private schools, but all the private schools were religious-based. So I went to a Greek Orthodox school for about 10 years, and it only went up to eighth grade, so I went to a Catholic school, and then I was like, I needed to go to a different school. So then I went to um, a Baptist school slash Christian school. Every religion told me that their religion was the right religion, and it was very conflicting for me, um, and, and especially some of the things, the hypocrisy that I, I noted in some of the churches and, and some of the actions that they were doing. And I don't mean to offend anybody, this is just my story that I'm, I'm explaining here. But um, even when I was six years old and the Greek Orthodox Church told me the story about Adam and Eve, well, we had a farm that we went to on the weekends, and that story, I just couldn't comprehend it because, you know, Adam and Eve started all the population in the world. Like, how does that happen? Because I know what happens when you mix the same bloodline of rabbits and, on the farm. You know, it just doesn't work out right. You have a black one and a white one, and you end up with a black and white one, or you end up with a black one or a white one. How do we get so many diversity of colors and nations, you know, in our communities when we came from two people? So that, as a six-year-old child, I couldn't believe that story. It, it just, it, and it stuck with me. I even asked my little Jewish friend when I got done, did you believe that story? And she's like, I don't know, you know? But um, it weighed on me, and I've always had these doubts and questions um, growing up. So when I was 25, I had my death experience, and I won't spend too much time on that, but um, when I went to the other side, I had three guides, and I would love to say that they were my, my relatives or something to that effect, or angels, but everything's commuted um, telepathically, so I didn't get to see them, per se. But they were beside me, behind me, and on the other side of me, and there was a smaller, I, I 
think of the Golden Girls because there was a smaller one, there was a medium one, and then there was a bigger one that was stronger, more powerful, and more, more knowledgeable. And I asked all these questions that I had been wondering about through my life from these uh, religious backgrounds that um, I was taught. So that I, I think I started out with, and, and I was 25, I was cocky, and, and so I wanted proof and I wanted to know what the answers were. And one of the first questions I think I asked is, well, why do we have ants? You know, what's the purpose of ants? And they said, to clean the carcass. You know, and that's true. You have dead animals and then you have ants that come in and clean the carcass. There's a purpose for everything. Um, a big question I asked is, what is up with the Bible? You know, there's so much conflict around it. What they told me, and I'm only going to tell you verbatim what they said, you interpret it how you feel. Um, the Bible was written for a different time of man. It was written by human and not by God. And the way I interpret a different time of man is we've evolved so much since the early days the Bible was written. Um, and if you were to explain to a child about death, you would use illustrations and stories to explain, you know, that your, your grandfather or your dog passed away and now they're in heaven. And they're not going to get that. So you have to tell a story. Well, here we're going to put their name in this balloon and we're going to let it go and it goes up in the sky. See, that's where they are. That's sort of how the Bible was written. They had to use illustrations and stories. And then, of course, there was the misinterpretations through the dialects and, you know, people taking advantage of it and using it for power. And I think if you ever watch the History Channel, the secrets of the Bible, when I watched that show, I was like, yes, that's everything that they were telling me is what is in that show. So if you get the opportunity to see it, it really put pins points a lot of the things that I was told. So I asked, you know, why do we have so many wars surrounding the Bible? Why, why do you let wars happen? Why do bad things happen? And uh, they told me that everything has to have perfect balance. You cannot have happiness without having sadness. You cannot have peace without having war. How would you know this is a peaceful time if you did not experience a war or hate or anger? We come here to feel emotions. We, that is a privilege that we don't get as much on the other side. Yes, we feel the love and, and you know, we feel a, a lot of compassion, but to feel the emotions, the anger that we feel, you know, yeah, get angry, feel it because you don't feel it on the other side. How can you understand that you're happy if you didn't feel unhappiness at one time? I mean, how many times have you been sick and then when you get better, you're like, I'm gonna go out and you know, I've gotta do all this stuff because I feel better today. Well, are you gonna have that same energy if you didn't have the opportunity to be sick? So everything has to be in perfect balance and it's not 50-50. Um, it's, and it goes with your diet, it goes with you know, how much rain we get, how much sun, everything in the universe has a perfect balance. And like I said, it's not 50-50, there is a perfect balance for each person, for each you know, environment, for each community, and it's reaching that perfect balance. Now we're always in a struggle to reach that perfect balance, and it rarely happens, and if, when it does happen, it doesn't always last forever. So that is like an aha moment when you do have a perfect balance in some aspect, whether it's your health or, you know, um, the weather, whatever it may be. Some of the other things that I asked um, or they told me is all animals and plants have souls. And I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, and I, I'm, I'm starting to understand the animal things through the years, but plants, too, they have souls as well. And then I saw this was years ago where they did the science project. Um, and it was on the news, you know, they had a plant here and a plant there, the same plant, they planted it at the same time. This one, they told it that they loved it and it was so beautiful and they told all this positive stuff and this plant thrived. And this plant over here, they said, you're ugly and you're never gonna go anywhere in life and you're never gonna produce and that plant died. So, I mean, what do you think? I mean, do y'all remember that story? It's pretty amazing, huh? Maybe plants do have souls. Um, and I'm just putting this out there, you, you digest it the way you feel. Uh, something else that I had asked um, is about the church. I always was judged for not going to church and I always was judged by religions. 
And so I asked, you know, do I have to go to church? I know people that go to church three, four times a week. You know, is, am I a bad person for not going to church? No, you can pray, pray anywhere you want. There is a socialness about going to church. And, you know, a lot of you understand this now, but back when I was young, I, I didn't understand it. But there's a socialness of going to church and um, joining together and the activities and the camaraderie, but you do not have to be in a church to pray. You can pray anywhere in the world, but there is a significant power in it that we have com coming together in the power of prayer together. So like when you're on your Facebook and somebody's sick and you wanna say, I'm praying for you, that means something when groups of people are coming together to pray for that person. Now, will that person be he healed? If it's not in their destiny, you know, they will have a different path. But if it's their destiny and we can help them along with that, the power of prayer means so much. And if we can come together with the power of prayer for world peace, you know, pray a praying day for world peace. I know there are prayer days out there where we can come together to do that. So let's, you know, we can tilt that balance of what's off Kelter here and change things through our intention. I was told that we all have a consciousness and our consciousness is our guide. It's not what you learn from what people tell you. It is what is in your heart and in your soul. You have a light and that light that is bright and shines, it will guide you and trust it. You are taught when you are a toddler the difference between right and wrong. You start choosing your past at such a young age and those experiences are your life experiences. You are not God. You are not perfect. No one is. And you're meant to make mistakes and you're meant to learn from it. So there is no judgment was one of the biggest messages that I had that no matter what happens, no matter what you've done in your life, you know, even people that have killed people before, you can still go to heaven. There is not, you're not condemned to going to hell because you made mistakes. You learn from them, you advance. That's what we're here for. And every time we come to earth, it's not the same course. I've, I try to help people that are passing in life, that are scared to die because of their religious backgrounds or their beliefs. They, they, they're afraid that something they did, that they might be, be condemned to hell. And so I, I enjoy helping people through that last chapter of their life and telling them that, you know, there is no judgment on the other side. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are loved for, for who you are, no matter what you've ever done. Um, so I think that's a, a destiny that everybody needs to understand. We chose our own path when we came here, um, something that I had seen was the fact that I chose not to be filthy rich, darn it, but I wanted to. I've been working on it, but it's not working. And no matter how hard I try, that was my choice when I came to, to this life. And, you know, I was given a life that I chose to be healthy, have a healthy family, have a moderate income, and, and that's what I've gotten. And I've been, I look back 25 years when this happened and I'm like, you know what, they're right. You know, when am I gonna start listening to what they told me? <laughs> and it, it's true. Um, let me see what else I have here. Everything in life, everything in the world is living. That was something that I had um, a, a trouble trying to understand what they meant by that. And, you know, use your own interpretation. I'd love to hear your feedback, but everything in this universe is living. This table is alive. How can that be? You know, I, I ask the same question. They say everything has a vibration. That vibration is its life. As we communicate, as you hear me, you're hearing my vibration in your eardrum. It's, it's not that you hear my words, it's being vibrated and translated to you. So when we have the, the crystal bowls that put out vibration and, and bells and you know tones that we hear the vibration, we, I'm standing here, next to Bob and I'm feeling his vibration. You know, it's, we all have vibrations and we can pick things up. Um, it's easier from some people, easier from some situations or more difficult from other situations. Vibrations are, are real and it is a basis of our foundation. Something else that they showed me was um, numbers and formulas and I don't know, understand it completely yet and I'm still working on that one. 
but they showed me just like like rolling numbers and algebraic for formulas and algorithms and I know I believe in the numerology I've, I've used it it works so I know that's part of it but there's just a science of numbers that is just so important so one of the big things that one of the big questions I had um, they showed me my past they showed me my future they showed me or my past my present my future and when they showed me my future they showed me something that was devastating to my children and that's when I decided I'm going back I, I'm going back and raise my kids if you ever watch Superman when he's trying to reverse time and he's got his fists out in front and he's going around earth backwards trying to reverse earth that's how I felt like I was coming back in my body I was like oh heck no I'm gonna go back and raise my kids and I had my fist out front and I'm like diving back through space and trying to get back to my body and I turn around and I said if you think you know who so much who is God and this is what they said wait for it <laughs> <I'm> just kidding <laughs> and use your own interpretation I'm just telling you what I was told what has the most powerful energy in the universe what is everywhere at every moment and wait wait for it oh what gives life to all things something pop in your mind and then they showed me the Sun okay I'm still working on it it's, it's hard to understand it's hard to comprehend but they're, everything else they've told me is right. So just putting that out there, just think about it. Okay? Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Wow. Deep stuff. Okay. Jim Bay, you're up. I'm up. I'll sit for this one. Uh, I'm going to do a little back story because it is very important to my story. In 2000, my one son uh, lived 10 days and died. He was a pound four ounces. In 2006, my other son died of kidney disease at 18. Uh, at, the, my, at the time, my wife found him dead in his apartment after three or four days. Uh, it's all part of the story, my book. Uh, in 2000, or 2009, November 15th, uh, I'm a little different in a couple of ways. Uh, we joke about it, my daughter, my son, We'll go to Walmart and we'll say, I bet you we could take a survey and see how many people had a father fall off a road. And that's what happened to me. I actually fell off the road, free fell 14 feet into a culvert. I ended up fracturing 26 fractures. I landed on my head. I got a quick version. Fractured my skull, brain bleed, concussion, traumatic brain injury. I uh, broke a, uh, my left scapula. I broke 11 ribs, seven on the four, four on the right. I broke C7 two ways. And I broke from T12 to T10, or T1, I broke nine of those, and I broke two A's. So I broke 23 fr bones with 26 fractures. And I actually, uh, why I brought up my kids, and it's very important to the story, is I actually, uh, I was dead. I didn't, I, but I claim I never left, I didn't die. But I was near death as you can be in the culvert, uh, bleeding. I had four inch crack in my head. I reached up with my only good arm. And uh, my hands, my fingers went into my skull, and I knew I was in trouble. And uh, if I didn't move, I was going to die from lack of blood. Uh, I didn't know if I could move, but I ended up climbing to the road to die because there was no hope, 26 fractures. I just want to say this. If you want to have an NDE, you don't want to have an accident. It's very painful. It's a painful way to go about it. And so I ended up um, climbing to the road, and... I got to the road, and this is where my encounter happened. And I'm a little different, too, and it's funny how it works out. And I've had some people come up and talk to me and thank me for saying I had an inner body experience. Uh, I was in the two realms at the same time, and I met God. And I was sitting outside, and as you can understand, I have a bunch of chronic pain from my uh, 26 fractures. Uh, they just decide which one today is going to hurt and which one isn't going to hurt. It all depends. It rolls around my body. Uh, I landed so hard, this side of my body never hit the ground, and I broke four ribs on the right side that never touched the ground. And I walked in. My, my daughter is, uh, was getting ready, and I said, I want to see Edmund Alexander. I actually saw him on a uh, book club that I'm part of that I did my book at, and 
uh, on Skype. So I walked in and got the coffee and I saw that nice cushy chair out there and I said, this is where I'm gonna sit and they had the doors open and I watched it from there. Well, this lady sat out there, Eloise, and uh, I became good friends with her talking and she came and told me, hey, I gotta tell you a story and it's an amazing story. And um, she had an inner body experience. So it really kind of like, every now and then you get those messages like, you know, just keep rolling. So <clears throat> what happened after that is uh, my kids were very important, so I moved the road to die and I was content on dying in this log. And I actually described this log straight out of a coma after I woke up. And that was my, all these stories have a common thread, but there's also a aha moment, like how can that not be? The one cool thing, I talked to non-believers and they, I say, okay, if you don't believe it happened to me, then I'm okay, but it's fact. Uh, sheriff found my blood and my cell phone in the hole and they said that it looked like someone shot a deer and gutted it and dragged it up the hill. And that's what it looked like at the scene. And I actually, after I met God at the log, I actually got up and walked 200 and some feet to my neighbor's house and knocked on her door. So it's fact, either way, I went from there to there. I'm saying I had help and I'm not this awesome guy. And if you don't believe it happened, then you're saying I'm that. So in the process, I, um, you get gifts. And uh, one of my first messages after I started to uh, process this, I'm like, how many, 20, what happened? I still pinch myself even though I have pain. I can't believe it, it's me, it, it, you know, since it's gonna be eight years coming up. But uh, before I fell, my belief system was, and I got a new word for it, I was a Christer Christian. That means I went to church on Christmas and Easter. And other than that, I did not go to church. Uh, I did not know the Bible. And the reason why I don't know the Bible and I didn't know the Bible is I always wondered why, why is all this killing happening over the Bible? Back in the day, the, you know, the Catholics, and I'm not, I'm not just knocking anybody, but all these scientists got killed. Why? If that's God's word and it's peaceful and it's beautiful, why, why is all that happening the way it was? So I didn't read the Bible. And I would talk to people, and they knew the Bible and everything, and I just continued on in life. And uh, so when I met God, and uh, I had some people afterwards come up and read the book, and they're saying, oh, you can't see God or meet God. That's what they say in the Bible. And I'm like, hey, God made all this. You call him Buddha, you call him whatever you want to call him. He made all this. He could do anything he want. Maybe it was Jesus' body talking to me uh, through God. But the figure I saw said, my son Jesus and the other thing that happened was my kids were there and I didn't talk to them that's why I brought up my kids in the beginning because it made me and my spirituality was very small I didn't know about shaman and Reiki I didn't know any of that any of that thing and I got asked on an interview not too long ago what'd you see an orb they didn't read the book what'd you see an orb or whatever and if an orb and a light came to me when I got to that log all by myself there's no way I would have moved so these experiences come to you and what you need at the time. The other thing that happened was I was only, it was a meeting. I didn't go to heaven, it all came to me, and it was a meeting. Just as I would meet you or you on the road, we talked, JC and I just talked, Lisa, Bob, it's just a meeting, it was a meeting, and it was not very long. I don't know how, time-wise, I can't you know, tell you exactly how much. I was unconscious in, in the culvert, and actually, I forgot to say that the culvert has water in it half the time of the year. So if the water was there, I wasn't living. And the door I knocked on, the lady I knocked on who ended up being my neighbor, she was away when I fell. So she just got home from Jersey, which is a four-hour ride. And if she went and stopped to the bathroom one more time, she would have come home to me on her front lawn. And so, but I didn't know the Bible, so that was my reason. Well when you meet the divine God whatever you would think you would have if you had the biggest question in the world you would have you know that was it so the conversation part of the conversation I had was uh, what what is the Bible what is it and he and it came in a figure form for me because that's the only thing that was going to move me from that log okay that's what I happened to me and he said to me that men interpret the Bible for their own good and as you notice, that 
those that interpret the Bible for their own good, are they in power anymore? Like, let's say the Romans or whoever, they fall out of power. And God, as we all know, keeps going on and the Bible keeps going on. So I took it that and I said, okay. So after I, uh, you know, woke up at a coma and processed all this, uh, my good friend in high school uh, helped me write the book. And that's an amazing story. We kind of met in the cemetery all places again after kind of not seeing each other for a while. That's a whole nother story. And uh, we ended up, you know, going to do that. And we're like, so one of the gifts, they say you get a gift when you run into the divine or whatever like that. And before I fell, I was a shy person. I wouldn't be doing this for sure. And why I do what I do now is the message is bigger than me. And I was as shy as could be. And I didn't know uh, I would say hello, and if I knew you, I'd talk your ear off, but to get to know you was very hard for me. And now I talk to everybody. I drive my kids nuts, and I talk to anybody and everybody. And the one cool thing is when people talk to me, they're waiting for Bible scriptures to come out of my mouth, and I still don't know the Bible. So I just tell them from the peaceful, spiritual part that he exists, he exists for all of us. And to continue you know, your journey, and it's to, to have the faith, you know, and to continue on. And the other thing that I've gotten from it, and this is the gift I got, I, I'm i still working out, and many people get the psychic abilities, I'm still working out whether that's really me or not. Uh, I don't claim that fact for right now. But uh, the one thing I get is, and some people are born this way, I wasn't born this way, but that gut feeling, like, I'll wake up and get a reason why I, you know, have the plans. We all have plans. And I end up getting a reason why I end up, um, you know, I get the plans. And then I wake up and I get this feeling like, nope, you're not doing that plan. You're going to go do this. Well, let me tell you, the first time that happened to me, it turned out very horrible because I ignored that plan. And it was very bad. So I process it when I went home and I said you know what you didn't do what your gut told you to do so I said maybe that you should listen so I ended up listening to the next plan and changed all my plans and it involved other people uh, to the point where some were upset with me and I went and did what the gut said and sure enough I was supposed to go do what that was to be and I met some people and they were having a difficult time and they thought things were horrible for them and then I somebody introduced me to them and after they kind of heard some of my story they were like wow things aren't really that bad so they uh, it made them feel better but there's other times which was I love is I get told to go do something and it's for my own good uh, as as we inspire, I get many messages, emails, people come up to me, you inspire me, you do this, you do that. We still need inspiration ourselves, and that's what a conference like this does for us. We we feel at home uh, together with the people we, uh, we relate to us, uh, to all of us, NDers, and all those that are interested, even just being you being interested. Again, don't have an accent, very painful, go the other way, but uh, don't do what I did. It's, you know, it's very painful. But it makes us feel good. When I actually, because I broke 26 fractures and involved my brain, and I actually was able after a coma, and I almost died twice in the coma uh, from the breathing tube, breathing tube, but I actually was able to, to talk to people. I actually was able to realize and tell them where I was, what hospital. But my family told me. So, but I, so right away they said, oh, I, I remember... Uh, Lisa Gard there, she, she said the same thing. She got sent home. Well, right away, they were like, oh, you're okay. We'll send you to physical, you know, the phys, uh, rehab, you know, in, in this place where they dealt with my fractured neck and my back and all my ribs. And I didn't go with a brain injury. So I didn't even, I did not sit in a room with someone with a brain injury for three years. And I finally found this group and I sat down and I said, oh, you leave the faucet on for 45 minutes? That's why they make them little holes so you don't overflow your apartment. 
Well, I leave my faucet on for 45 minutes. I used to make uh, eggs, devil eggs, cut them up in my salad, and I would chill them in the sink. Sure enough, 45 minutes later, let me tell you, those eggs were chilled because the water was running the whole time. So I didn't realize that, you know, I thought I was different, and then you get in a room with people. So I finally got in a room with the brain injury, and this is my first conference. I've done other things, but this is my first conference for the IONS, and it, you feel at home is part of my message. Uh, you, you feel, and I got that second feeling based on my brain injury, you know, meeting people with the brain injury. So I, I just, you know, I take my, you know, the message and I take it from, in my website, I, God's for everybody, whether you know the Bible or not. And whatever you believe in, uh, it's, but you got to believe. If you don't believe, you don't believe. And my other message I got which most people understand and most people agree with it and you don't have to have a near-death experience but if you're a believer and um, someone could be 80 years old and they can uh, not believe and on the 80th birthday 81st birthday they believe God's there for you so whether or not it's just you know you take what you want I, I happen to uh, you know believe I listen to Christian music actually the day I got hurt I was listening to Christian music on the way home I'm a crazy metal detector guy and I dig out houses for bottles, so I'm kind of a nut anyway. And uh, but you know, I to just just continue on and believe, and have the faith. And I just, I it was hard. And I actually wrote the book, my friend, four years. I just want to say this, and I didn't. I and as other people write books and everybody, it's a lot to come out and say that you you know had this experience. But two, in order for you either spread the word you actually got to become kind of you got to be doing this stuff and i actually was like do i really want to do that and i almost pulled the book back and then i got a message while i was sleeping that it's not for me it's not about me although it's my story it's really not about me it's the message and you pass it on and uh there's some there's a second because there's a lot of things happen but there's some people that come up to me and my books opened up doors for them for death because the death there's a lot of death in my book unfortunately but there's a lot of Bubba stories too because my nickname is Bubba so it's Jim Bubba Bay and it would be too heavy so I had to put the Bubba stories in there so it's it's to lighten it up so I, I just you know but you know just keep telling your story and keep keep working on it working on it working on it and so I decided with the message that just put it out there and if one person helps one person it's it's well worth it and my favorite thing of all and I don't want it, but anyway it's all the people you meet and what I like too, and as I'm sure everybody else in this room who's had it once you let it be known that you had an experience as sim, you know we had other other people feel comfortable to come up to you and they let you know and I love hearing stories the lady out there, Eloise, my friend, my new friend, was tell, told me her story, and I just sat here, and I just relaxed. And, of course, she felt so comfortable, because she's like, you understand. And I'm like, I do, you know? And they're all, they all end up with the, you know, the divine, and we're all here to come back. And the only thing else I gotta say is, when, when I, was, I was content on dying at the log, and the log's a big story, because I described it straight out of a coma, and it was pitch black when I actually met, until it got light, and I was able to describe the log. But, I just, you know, I was mixed because I had two kids in heaven. My one son was a pound four ounces, lived 10 days. So if you believe in heaven, where else would he be? And my other son was 18, so where would he be? And then I had three kids on earth. So I was uh, mixed emotions, and I was ready either way. So, you know, they asked if you wanted to come back or not. But anyway, that's my story, and thanks for listening. Okay. Okay. I know one thing, my next ND, I'm not going to fall in a hole. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Okay, JC, your show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Good morning, everybody. My name is JC Gordon, and I live in Vancouver, Canada. Um, my near-death experience happened on June 25th, 1996. Prior to that, I had been as left-brained as one possibly could be. I thought that life was all about making as much money as possible. I was a banker. I was successful in the banking industry. I had, I had rose to the top, uh, uh, close to the top of the banking industry as what one could get to. And it sickened me because all I found around me were, sorry to say this, but were snakes. 
and the and I realized that I didn't want to be any any uh, anymore be a part of that. And it was in 1994 that I semi-retired and I got out of that industry. I sold my businesses and I moved to the most remotest part of my province of British Columbia that I knew at that time it was a, a small remote community called Bella Coola, which is about 400 miles north of Vancouver. There's about 3,000 people that lived in, in Bella Coola, half of them were native Indians. And I uh, built my own log house, put in my own power system, and on June 25th, 1996, I was bucking some wood when the chainsaw kicked back and went through my throat. And at that precise moment, I internally heard a voice. And that voice said, everything's going to be okay. I have a purpose for your life. And for me at that moment in time, I never felt anything. Adrenaline kicked in. I just I never felt anything. Uh, but from that moment in time, everything just completely slowed down. And I knew that I was going to be fine. Uh, 45 minutes later, I was delivered to the emergency room. I was on the emergency room table. Doctor was standing about 18 inches away from her, or maybe three feet away from me. The nurse on the other side. Then all of a sudden, I'm not looking at them this way. I'm on top of the room. And I'm looking down at the backs of their head. I'm looking down at myself. And it was that from that moment that I went into total blackness. I went, it, was, it was almost like a rickety elevator. And I remember looking up and seeing this, this, it was like the first star. You know like the first star you see at night is really, really small? Well, that's what I saw. And I continued to watch that. And it, it just got brighter. It just grew and grew and grew until it was an all-encompassing white light that I literally just went through. And where I landed was on top of a mountain. There was no, no other life there. But the, the instant that I was on top of the mountain, I just knew that I was home. I knew that where I was was where I was supposed to be. And very shortly after that, I, I felt like a, a, a little nudge on my, on my elbow like this. I didn't have any body, but, but I felt that. And it just led me down the mountainside, and I wasn't walking, I was just kind of floating, across the grass, and about one o'clock, I noticed that there was this castle-like structure. It was round, it had this fence around it, and as I got close to the fence, the gates just opened, I went through it, I went through the, the, the main doors of the, of the structure, went to the right, up the stairs, along the top floor, and there's a room on the right, and I remember it looked like a library. It was big. It was oval. There were, they weren't books, but it was almost like CD sleeves that were there. And I went past that. There was a room on the, on the left. There were four entities sitting in there. They were sitting in a circle, cross-legged. They had hoodies on. They didn't look at me, and I just went past that. Then I went into the next room on the right, and I sensed the door close behind me. Complete blackness. And all of a sudden, I started to feel a presence. I started to feel a warmth that, that came. And lights, little, little six lights formed a hexagon. And out of that hexagon, it was like violet lightning that connected it all. And then in, in the middle, it was a, it, a circle form. And it, it was, remember a long time ago, I'm showing my age here, but when TV stations would go off at night and you had like that snow on the TV screen, well, that's what, what this was. And it started communicating with me. It was all energy. It started communicating with me. And I would get, I call them in my book, zings, violent lightly zings, that would hit me between my eyes, although I had no eyes. But every time I got one of those communications, I knew what it meant. Where I ended up was I was literally communicating directly with the source of all consciousness. And the source of all consciousness asked me to come into that round structure. The source is asexual. It is both male and female. The male outside was the mind, the consciousness of source. The inside was the womb. And it took me within its womb and it delivered me, I felt like I was back in a high school lab, my a chemistry class. And where it took me was 
to the events, to the place where everything happened before time began. And it showed me life from its perspective at this time. I was like a fly on the back of the wall. And it zinged me and said, I'm going to morph into a form that you can understand. And it did. And it then, with its two hands, uh, turned around and, and just energetically created its matrix for life. And it was from this matrix that everything came from to create everything that is its life. And what it did, there were 10 seals on this matrix. And it unleashed the seals from the 10th seal and the first four seals. The first four seals began life. The 10th seal was the end of life. It also showed me everything that is to happen and will happen after time as we know it stops. Because what the source of consciousness is, is the totality of simultaneous time. Time as we know it is, is, is a past, present, and future. But it's only a small component of the totality of what the source of consciousness is. And it showed me that a, a, a way to illustrate uh, what time was, I, I kind of use this as an example when I'm speaking, I, I say, think of time as the Empire State Building, or a very, very tall structure. Everything that happened before time was that foundation of that structure. Our understanding of time now is like we're walking on that ground floor, and we are to move into the end of time. And that's what I was showing. And I w when that was done, I went out the womb, and I was back in that room where I, I first landed. And I was told, it's now time for you to go back. I have a purpose for your life. I said, no, I'm not going back. I, I've written 14 books on this journey that I had. Um, and one of the books that I, 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 I wrote, I interviewed about 100 people who had near-death experiences. And we all had one common denominator with us all. And that was not, none of us wanted to come back. But I was trying to negotiate with God. I'm saying, no, I'm not coming back. Yes, you have to go back. And, and the final time after it said, you have to go back, and I said, no, it left the room. The, en the energy just literally left the room. And I turned around and I went back. And I, I had the opposite journey. I went out of the structure, up, up the mountain. And I saw at the top of the mountain a rabbit hole. And I knew I had to go down it. So when I went down it, I was now moving through the cosmos of time in the reverse direction that I came. And all of a sudden, I'm in the emergency room again. There were a few more people in the emergency room now. And I just slowly went down beside my body, into my body, opened up my eyes. The physician's there. He was a, he was a, uh, a locum, an, an, a retired locum. He was the only one that had the ability to stitch me up. And he was so cool. So he, he just looks at me and he says, oh, it's okay, he's back. <laughs> and then I got wheeled in. Anyways, I had the surgery, got wheeled into the room. But I knew that the profundity of what it was that I was revealed, I had, I, I, that was my purpose to come back, to let people know what it was. And for a week after I came back, I couldn't sleep because I was just vibrating with excitement. Was, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with all this? And I remember going to the first two friends, uh, or I had a, a couple friends that I went to, and I told them what had happened to me. And I could tell by the way they look, were looking at me, they thought I had lost it, right? It's like, what is this guy talking about? But they were nice, and they asked me some questions. And they were really, really great questions about my experience. And I couldn't answer them. I didn't know how to answer them. And what that did to me is it, it, it seared me. It just, because I knew the profundity of what I had was needed to be known. I had always been a truth seeker in my life and a fact lover. I had the truth, but I didn't have the facts. And I knew that I had to discover those facts. Well, that was in 1996. And I have literally been on a 21-year journey 
looking at every aspect of science, of religion, of philosophy, of spirituality, and they all had pearls of wisdom that acted as dots, that connected the dots to uh, lead me to understand the facts so that I can explain them in a way that our consciousness can understand. Um, as a result of what I do now, I'm a consciousness empowerment coach, and what I do is I take people on that journey to meet source, the infinite mind, and, and download the infinite mind into us. Because what I learned was that it's not us that needs God. It's God that needs us. And I saw the end. And what the end is, what the great thought is all about, is source is creating his body. And what his body is, is every moment of unconditional love that ever was. It exists, it's alive right now in the end. And where we are at from a perspective of time is those seals on the matrix, what are called forward velocity, are meeting the reverse velocity. We are at that point in time right now, I call it the era of synchronicity, where the convergence point of time, where forward moving velocity meets reverse velocity. Now, I'm sure many of you know what rever reverse velocity is, but for those of you who don't, reverse velocity is this. Let's say you're holding a wine glass and you drop it. It shatters. Reverse velocity takes that shattered glass and makes it whole. And that's where we are at right now. We are moving out of reverse velocity to make every moment of our unconditional life be part of who we are forever and ever. And life is not just in this universe. There are a hundred trillion other universes similar to ours that make up the whole of what the infinite body is. And every person on this planet 7.5 billion of us have all experienced a moment of unconditional love with each other in another universe. Every one of those moments will come alive again and, and, and they're already existing. And there's only one thing that we have to do right now and that's make the choice that we want to be part of it. And it will happen because it's there. The beauty of what I saw of Source's unconditional love is this, is he has left it to every single one of us to choose it. It's our free will to decide if we want it. It's there, it's waiting. It took me 21 years to be able to succinctly get on this stage and explain it. This is my coming out party. This is the first time that I am coming out with this. And thank you. And back in 1996, when I had this experience in Vancouver, I had no one to talk to about it. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And I am forever grateful to Ions because in 1998, they were in Vancouver and on the UBC campus, and I attended that. And at that point in time, my journey was significantly waning. I knew what it was, but I had no idea where, what to do with it. I had no idea where to go with it. And it was PM Atwater's talk that saved my life. And I had the, the fortune yesterday to meet her for the very first time and thank her because during my 21-year journey, I call it my post-NDE journey, 
it was very important for me to not get involved or know anything on a horizontal basis that was happening because my relationship, my training ground was this vertically. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here and, 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 and listening to me and uh, uh, thank you for your time. Wow. Kind of interesting. I'm psyched. So what we what we got is 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 three really different perspectives on on the data download, the information that came out. Very different angles, very different approaches, but some very common threads between all of them. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. Um, is that we know we got started a little bit late because of the the earlier session. It is lunch break, so we we can go ahead and continue to run on. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and take questions or some and, and then we'll do is we'll let we'll let our panelists go ahead and ask them so if if, if anybody wants to come up and uh, to the microphone we'll take those questions and then we can let our let our panelists answer them uh, uh, about their you know the data download or perhaps your comments that you might want to make on your data download how it relates to them uh, but if but if, if you do want to go ahead and go to lunch that that's fine uh, because we know we all got started about 15 minutes late but we're going to go ahead and stay here and, and answer your questions as long as we can. The good thing is it is lunch and we've got a little time to work with. So first question up. Hi there. Thank you for participating in this conversation. Um, my question is, is for all of you, actually. And I'd like to have more understanding of uh, when I have my dreams, they're very vivid. Your experiences clearly have some distinction between probably every dreams that you have every night. I'd like to understand that a little bit more. So would each of you take a moment to explain um, the, the quali quality, the qualitative difference, I guess, of how you experience your dreams versus this experience that you had in your NDE? We'll start Thank you, that's a great question. Um, it, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> For me, after my NDE, I thought it was a dream but I had to have it validated and they knew that and they gave me facts that happened later in life and that differentiated between now I know this is real. I have to accept this, I have no choice. I was a skeptic. You know, I've been taught so many different religions and I didn't believe, I didn't have a belief of what heaven would look like. So my heaven was pretty a blank screen. It was just in space. Um, you know, with stars and, and, and darkness. So when they gave me the validation that I needed, that's what told me that it was, it was different. It was not a dream. So if you have these dreams and these messages and you're not sure if it's a dream or if it's real, ask. Say, show me something that tells me that I can, that this is factual, that this is validated. Um, for example, my father had passed, and I didn't feel him present around me. And so I asked for, show me a sign, Dad, that you're here. And we collected coins together. I'm like, but don't just give me a coin because that's so common. I need something that's really different. Like, give, give me something that's special and really different. And I'm like, and don't give me a penny. So I know because <laughs> pennies are so common. And I went to McDonald's and got some change, threw up my cup, and then, you know, I, I went home and had changed my pocket, threw it in the dresser, and for a week, this chewed up, unidentified, unidentified thing that was a dime, I finally looked at it, and I'm like, why does this keep showing up? <laughs> and there it was. It, it was my father, because I asked, so always ask. Um, for, for me, I uh, actually... I got confirmed that the, um, uh, I was, when I woke up out of coma, I was 99% sure that what happened happened. And then when I uh, woke up and uh, I got taken, my uh, family had made a Karen Bridge website for me. And when I was in rehab, they wheeled me to the, uh, uh, to look at messages. My neighbor actually wrote a message, God must have put you on my door. And it was pretty powerful what she wrote without knowing that I met God. And in, in the picture, uh, there it was, the log I described straight out of a coma that I met God at, and my family said there was a ton of blood at this log, so I obviously stopped. So that was confirmation for me that that happened. And then while I was in the hospital, uh, an angel came to me, and I 
wouldn't even know what an angel was before. I mean, I knew what, you know, but I didn't have my spirituality was much smaller than it is now. And, but what helps me, the crazy thing for me is since my accident, I say to myself when I go to bed, what movie am I going to watch tonight? Because it's surround sound, full IMAX, blowout dreams every night. So it's very interesting in a way, and I get messages from it. Matter of fact, I was having a Reiki seal. I got to get, remember, I didn't know any of this existed. I wasn't living under a rock, but I didn't know any. Of the, I went to a Reiki like, group healing, and the, the guy who did the healing said there was an angel over your shoulder all day, well, the whole time. And I'm like, oh, really? He's like, yeah. So it's great, and I loved it, and I felt good. And so I went home. This kind of blew my mind, even though I understand it all now. So I go home, and I'm, at the time, I'm living by myself. My one son lives with me now. And I back up my car. I get out. I open my door. I unlock my door. And I left the keys in the door. Oh, and before I forgot that, he said the angel had a horn, his own horn, hanging with me. And I actually was about 30 feet from my door, no wind, nothing that could do it. And all of a sudden, my car started locking and locking, beep, 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 without, and I just, all on its own. And the only thing that could have done it for, that I could capably doing it was the car key, and that was hanging in the door. So obviously, the angel followed me home. And before I fell, I would have been freaked out. But since I fell, I understood exactly what was happening. Thanks, Jim. That's a great question. And, and, and dreams for me were, have been very profound, but profound in, in, a, in a unique way. I actually call them reverse dreams because it was a 21 year, my post NDE was a 21 year journey for me. And I wrote. 14 books about this all along. They were stepping stones along the way that, that got me to the point where I'm at now. But I would be awakened. I would be sound asleep and awakened with, with a download. And at the beginning, I didn't want to know anything about it. I just wanted to go back to sleep, but I could never go back to sleep. And very early on, I started to get up and, and write what it was that I was being downloaded. Sometimes it was very brief, I just, I just scribble it. Sometimes I'd be on the computer doing pages and pages. But whenever I had one of those reverse dreams, it was the information that I was required to know to take me to the next step. And so dreams were absolutely profound for me. They absolutely drove my wife crazy at the beginning because she says, what are you doing? I says, well, I got to go and write something. She goes, oh, whatever. But it's been a number of years, and she's just gotten to the point where it's like, oh, okay, he's, he's gone. But dreams for me were very profound. And one in particular was one of my mother who, who passed the same day as Princess Diana, which is literally 20 years later to this month. And she came to me as clear as I see you. And she was in the same form as I remember her when she passed from an age perspective. And she said to me, I'm letting you go. Now, I was adopted at birth. And that night when I came home, I had an email message. Uh, and I got on the email message, and it was from the Canadian Adoption Agency. Um, I had registered with them about 25 years. I forgot I even did it. It was like 25, 30 years earlier. And it was a message from my birth sister who had reached out to me and wanted to know if I wanted to have contact. So that dream was the, the releasing. Of my mother, who was protecting me and watching me, said, it's okay, I'm letting you go because I was now introduced to my birth family. And I went from being an only child to having two sisters and a brother. And I met my father for the first time. Uh, that was back in 2008, and he passed in 2010. So dreams are, have been very, very profound for me. Wow. Boy, that's psyching me out. <laughs> that's, really, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, okay. Other questions? I, I saw some other folks. Yeah, well, here's another one. Uh, I have questions for uh, 
for all of you. <clears throat> but I, first I want to say, Lisa, I just bow to your six-year-old child that had those questions, you know, because how many of us had, I mean, at that age, most children, what are they thinking of, you know? So I, I have to really admire that six-year-old child, and I'm, I'm sure you've become genius for, for, for asking those. <clears throat> My question is, uh, I'm very aware that the, the divorce rate, as, as Eben Alexander said this morning, is about 70% because we drive our spouses crazy. We're not the person we used to be. How did you two men in particular survive that? And was that also, were, were you married, Lisa, at the time? No, actually, I was in an abusive relationship at the time, and, and that might have been from part of my illness. Um, I might have wanted to exit left uh, subconsciously because I, was, I felt like I was trapped in, an, in a situation that I couldn't get out of. Um, I married later. I have a, a wonderful husband and very supportive and, and spiritual you know, himself, so thank you. As far as I go, um, I was... Uh, um, single you know we had broken up uh those of you who have lost kids know it's a lot on your uh marriage and then um to have two kids pass away and then on top of that have uh anybody that has a terminally ill family member understand the the time that goes into all that and energy and finances and uh it put quite a strain on the marriage and uh we're friends now and uh we continue to be friends and uh I am single, and uh, at the time that I fell, I was on my own. Um, for me, uh, I was in a relationship that I knew was over for, a, a, for like a lot of years, right? And it was six weeks after that that I left. Okay, we take one more question? Okay, good. This is uh, more a comment. Uh, so I was going to go last, <laughs> uh, but so I was just going to say about the Bible um, and stuff. If you read the first chap, first verse of Luke and Acts, it's clear it's a human dedicating this to Theophilus. They don't see those quotes in Bible study typically, and I'm really glad that I took a college-level New Testament class, which exposed me to Ellen Plegel's, which even referred to, who even referred to earlier, and people like Bart Erdman. And I could see how the current trend in, in the right-wing Bible people is so different. But I wanted to, what I wanted to do was quote the last two paragraphs from a Pulitzer Prize-winning book which sums up everything, which is The Bridge of San Luis Rey by Thornton Wilder. And it is, um, but soon we shall die, and the memories of all those we have loved and lost will have left the earth. And we ourselves shall be remembered for a while and forgotten, but the love will have been enough. All those impulses of love return to the love that made them. There is a land of the living and a land of the dead. And the bridge between them is love, the only survival, the only meaning. So okay. that sums thank you. up today. Well said. Love. Okay, love. thank you. It's love is the answer.